go back to a map. Like, what is this piece of paper, and how will it ever fold back the same way that it once was? It's just very confusing. Not very good at map folding, apparently. Um, and it was very hard. And I thought, you know, Siri's been around for, what, two, three years? Um, it's not very long. And how dependent I have already become, especially when you move to a new city and you don't know anywhere, like, Siri, take me to... I don't know, the falafel drive-in. Take me to wherever, um, and you go straight there. And to actually move away from that was difficult for me, and to actually think, okay, I have to get out a map and look at a map and work out which way north and south and all that crazy stuff is, and then find where I was going. Well, that is sort of a metaphor for what we're going to talk about today in the fact that the Jews, in their experience, used to trust in certain things. They used to place their dependence, their focus, their weight on certain things which were important to their faith, and then something else happened, and that something else was Jesus. And we'll see why that is a problem as Stephen explains it. So this morning, we're going to look at Stephen's speech, which goes from Acts 6, 8 to 7, 60. Um, and just to give you some relief, we're not going to be reading the whole thing because that would take a while. I'm going to give you brief snippets which explain it, but it is going to be a lightning tour of Old Testament history. So Put on your seatbelts. Here we go. Number one, advancing the gospel always meets resistance. Advancing the gospel always meets resistance. This part from Acts 6, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So it starts with arguments, then it progresses to lies, and finally false accusations. And the sad part of this is that the opposition comes from within the Jewish camp. This is not the Romans or the Greeks that are objecting. It's the Jews themselves who should have been expecting and anticipating a Messiah who have a problem with the idea that there is a Messiah. This is a civil war. Stephen is seeking to offer a critique from within, a prophetic voice that guides the people the right way, but that's not how his actions are interpreted. The Jews arguing against him feel threatened because he is speaking against their cherished traditions. If that results in a split or any kind of rebellion within Judaism, that's a problem. The Romans so far have been pretty much content to let the Jews be about their own business, and they're not interfering with their worship. They can go about their synagogues and their temple and everything else, it's okay. But if they start looking rebellious, Rome will stomp down on them with a heavy foot, and that could mean disaster for the whole nation. So two key charges are brought against Stephen, that he is speaking against the law and Moses by implication, who was the giver of the law, and that he is speaking against the temple and the land which they occupy. To understand how offensive this will be to them, you have to imagine the cherished symbols of a nation being trashed right in front of their eyes. So I have some cherished symbols of America right here, just to help you feel a little bit of the emotional impact of this. So I have a flag, and I have a copy of the Constitution, and I have some American money, the real symbol of America, in God we trust, apparently. Um, so. It's as though Stephen is saying, your flag, yeah, I don't really care about that. It's not supposed to touch the ground, don't care. Um, and your constitution, yes, well, here's what I think about that. And also your money, which apparently is illegal to deface, right? It's illegal to deface your money. All right, here, screw on that, there, and throw that down. And that's what I think about your cherished national symbols. That's sort of offensive. In fact, I find it slightly offensive myself. If, if ever my children let the flag touch the ground, I complain, I'm going to pick it up now because I can't take it anymore. Um, <laughs> see, I'm a true American. <laughs> just, that's okay. But this is, if that was just a hint, if you felt a hint of offense there, just imagine how much more the Jews would have felt offended by Stephen apparently attacking these big items. And his long speech 
is an attempt to answer these charges, but not in a way that's going to get him off. This is not, uh, oh, it's all a misunderstanding, I'm very sorry, what I meant to say was, and they're like, oh, okay, then we'll let you go. It's not that sort of defense. You've probably heard the saying, the best form of defense is an aircraft carrier. Oh, um, <laughs> preferably Nimitz class. No, the best form of defense is attack. Uh, and what Stephen is going to do here is attack them and show them that Jewish life needs to be recast in light of the coming promised Messiah, Jesus. So, the first one he's going to talk about, this cherished symbol, is the land. The land. That's the first cherished symbol that he's going to speak on. And he talks about that in verse 30 of chapter 6. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Well, you would think, well, they all know this story. They're good Jewish people. They know the story. But, but he's making an interesting point. He's saying God's significant activity has usually taken place outside of the confines of Palestine, not in the Promised Land, but where God has moved significantly in Israel's past is mostly outside of the Promised Land, not inside. That's the point he wants them to understand. And that wherever God meets his people can rightly be called holy ground. God calls his people to move forward in their religi religious experience, and dwelling even in the land of promise requires a pilgrim mentality in which the land can be appreciated but never venerated. So you have to pitch it at a certain level. Venerating the land to an excessive degree leaves no room for later revelation. If the land is everything, if the land is rest and remnant and freedom and security and peace, then, then what else do you need? If the land is the everything, then there's no room for later revelation or later promise. Now, there is a temptation I think it's smaller, but for us to view America in the same way as a Christian nation. I've, I've had conversations with people who said, well, you know that this nation was founded on Christian principles. And I understand the concept, but then I say, but didn't you have slavery for like hundreds of years? Is that a Christian principle? Or, or how, how did you miss that one? How did you overlook that one, slavery on the basis of skin color? It doesn't seem very Christian to me. And there's not really a very good answer to that. And we like to think that our nation, our forefathers were very Christian, but some of them were. Some of them were more theistic than Christian. Some of them didn't believe in miracles. Some of them didn't believe in the supernatural. And it is a point of debate about how Christian the founding fathers really were. I mean, you're already left your beautiful home country of England in direct contradiction to the Bible, which says submit to the governing authorities. So how Christian is that to start with? But it's a question. It's tempting for us as Americans, I include myself, to see this as God's chosen land and the land out of which blessings should go to the rest of the world. And it might be surprising for you to know that other countries do not see America the same way. They do not see America as the source of blessing for the whole world. In fact, some other countries, some in South America, now see America, Northern America, USA, as a mission field. And you're like, well, the audacity, the very hub of Christianity is here, surely. But, well, they look at America and they see gun violence and murders and abortions, and they say, there's a country that really needs Jesus. And they send missionaries here. And who's to argue with that? But we can, if we're not careful, have this sort of nationalistic Christian mentality that, that this is where Christianity flows out to the rest of the world, not realizing that God is moving in other parts of the world, and we could really be blessed by some of that happening here. We, we've got to avoid that sort of idea that we are the font of blessing for the rest of the world. It's tempting, too, for us to, like the Jews, rely on our own resources and our history and say we've got all we need. Because in many ways, America does have all it needs in terms of Christian resources. There are more Christian books, radio stations, churches, preachers, blah, 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 here than probably in any other country in the world, except maybe Vatican City, which I'm assured has a lot of Christians. But... You know, in terms of Christian resources, America has more than any other country. But is that, can we draw a direct line, therefore we are the holiest country, therefore we are the 
country with the best disciples, the godly. I don't think we can draw that line. So we can't be drawn into this idea of relying on our past tradition or depending on the resources that God has blessed us with and think we don't need more of God right now. We, we can't rest in that. Then, in this speech, Stephen goes on to talk about Moses and introduces a rejection theme, which will lead to his point about the rejection of Jesus as a type of second Moses. So, the next thing he's going to talk about is the law. The law, the law, was also a very cherished part of Jewish history. And this is what he's going to say about that. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts returned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. Well, there's a warning, isn't it? Reveling in what our own hands have made. So there was a veneration of Moses as the lawgiver. And even though there were many different factions within Judaism at the time with different perspectives, what they all had in common was this veneration of Moses. Whatever else you're going to say, let's agree that Moses is significant for the faith. And Stephen uses their high view of Moses to make this point. Moses himself spoke of God later raising up a prophet just like me, which means Israel cannot limit the revelation of God to just the law. They can't say God stopped speaking once the law was written and it's done because God himself said more is to come, so don't stop there. Secondly, Moses was rejected by his own people even though he was God's appointed redeemer. It's really brilliant how Stephen is setting them up here. He's like, you know God sends redeemers from time to time, and you know how sometimes people misunderstand the redeemer and reject him. They're like, yes. I mean, he's just leading them into a trap. He said, well, you did that with Moses, and this parallels the way Jesus of Nazareth was treated by the majority of the nation, even though he was the Messiah. And then thirdly, this is his point, even though Moses was with you, you had the law and the sacrificial system, the people still fell into gross idolatry and opposed God. So the point he's making here is, if the law is your everything, if the law is sufficient, if you've got Moses and sacrifices and the law, if that's all you need, why then did you fall into gross idolatry and disobedience? If the law is really all that it's cracked up to be, why did you fall? And of course, they don't have a good answer to that. So the key point is that Moses pointed to someone beyond himself who would come, that the law and Moses alone are not enough, and God had more in store. So he then moves on to the next cherished item of Jewish history, which is the temple. And this is what he says about the temple. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? It's interesting that in the history of the temple, there are questions both at the beginning and the end about the legitimacy of it. If you remember, in the beginning, King David decides that he should build a temple for God. He's like, here I am in my lovely palace, and God has nothing but a tabernacle, basically a big tent, and I should build a temple for God. And he says to Nathan, the prophet, should I go and build a temple for God? And Nathan says, sure, great idea and then goes away and actually spends some time with the Lord and asks him what he thinks about it. And then Nathan comes back to David and says, terrible idea, don't do it. You, your hands have got blood on them, you're a soldier, leave it for your son to do. And so the temple is not built by David. And then later on in history, we come to this part in the New Testament where again, Stephen is saying, God does not live in buildings made by human hands. And we know from history that in AD 70, in the Jewish Roman war, that the temple was actually destroyed. Now, the tabernacle was at least mobile. Um, Stephen is a little bit disparaging of the temple, calling it just a house. It's like calling it a shack. Um, but he says, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. The Jews never taught exactly that God lived in the temple, but they spoke of his name and his presence being there. So it's almost but not quite believing that God lived in the temple. So the main idea 
that Stephen is communicating here is that God is not ultimately revealed in the tabernacle or the temple, but God is ultimately revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And that if you are so obsessed with these three, you may not see this. And you need to have room in your understanding of God's revelation to see that Jesus is not only important, but preeminent over all these other things. So here comes the indictment. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. So this is very anti-Israel. The history of Israel is of sin, rebellion, and rejection of God's purposes. They are stiff-necked, like when Israel rebelled against Moses and they built the golden calf. And he's saying, God's judgment rests upon you, just as it did on your ancestors. You have a pattern of rejecting and killing God's prophets. Nothing has been learned from the past. And so they stone him to death. Stephen's goal was not to renounce the law, the land, and the temple, but to place them in their proper significance in relation to Jesus Christ, to raise up a prophetic voice to steer the people right. But they fulfill his prophecy about what happens to God's prophets. They're faced with two choices. Either they can admit their terrible error regarding Jesus, or they can find Stephen guilty of blasphemy, condemned to death. They shouldn't have carried out the death penalty. We know this, right, from the story of Jesus, that they have to get the Romans to do the dirty work because they're not allowed to carry out the death penalty themselves. But either they are so outraged that they ignore that law or the mob gets so incensed that they just kill him, but they just ignore it and they go ahead anyway. This is how it reads. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, He said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So there is the murder. He died for the right thing. He died for the truth about Jesus. So what does all of this mean for us? I mean, yes, that's a fascinating history lesson, but what does it all mean for us? Well, I think there are two dangers. One is that we may revere something more than Jesus. And no, we don't have land law and the temple to be revered in quite the same way, but we may have tradition. That might be a block of reverence for us. Or we may have History, the history of our faith, the history of this church, the history of where we grew up, potentially could be a barrier. And the gloriously American one, preferences. Preferences can be a barrier. I think it's a a fascinating one to consider because we are so used to having our preferences satisfied in this Burger King, have it your way society aren't we? I mean, if you go into a restaurant and you want to customize the menu, that's not a problem at all in America. I would love to accompany some of you in Europe if you tried that and see if you made it out alive. But this is like, add that, take that, replace that with it. It just doesn't happen. Um, But we can import that mentality into our religious experience and start to expect our preferences to be fulfilled and allow that to be a barrier of how God might want to move differently. So, What Israel failed to recognize was that Jesus was better than law, land, and temple. That he fulfilled the law perfectly with perfect obedience to the heavenly father. That in many ways, he was the land. He was the inheritance. He was everything that they were hoping for. And that in a very real way, he is the temple in that he is the place where human beings meet God. So our danger may be that we revere other things more than Jesus, but there's another one too, that we may want Jesus and something else, that Jesus alone is not enough. 
thinking about the traditions for a moment, there are plenty of stories of churches splitting over issues of tradition that are about non-essential things. One of the things that they split over is which things are essential and which things are non-essential. But some churches split over music style, over preaching style, not content, but style, over traditions that are man-made and not biblical. Theoretically, this should not happen in a Christian church, which seeks to be biblical above all else, but even we are in danger of revering traditions and practices over the person of Christ. Now, in case some of you are getting nervous right now and thinking he's going to cancel weekly communion, not at all. Uh, I'm not planning to do anything like that, so don't be alarmed. Um, But it's always a good reminder that our traditions, our history, they must never become more important than Jesus. They must never take the place or obscure Jesus from our life. When we make Christianity about anything other than Jesus, we fail. When we make Christianity about style over substance, we fail, because Jesus has to be our center. Let me just ask some diagnostic questions about Jesus being our center. For what do we sacrifice our money? Is our life hidden with Christ in God, or is it hidden in consumption and consumerism? It's tempting, especially in Silicon Valley, to be drawn into consumerism. I remember when I got my first iPhone, thinking it was like that, it will complete me, sort of feeling it. And it doesn't, especially now. Thank you, Siri. Um, (laughs) But that was a gift from the Lord. Do not trust in the Siri, but trust in the Lord always, and a map. Um, But stuff tends to promise more than it can actually deliver, um, and we need to be careful with that. Uh, Our life should not be hidden in consumption and consumerism. The next question, when we are hurt, where do we go for comfort? When we are hurt, where do we go for comfort? Is it Jesus or is it some anesthetic, whether that's food, alcohol, some other chemical, relational or entertainment-based comfort? Do we go to those places or do we go to Jesus? What do we really get excited about? Is it Jesus and the things of God or is it sports? I've read some articles recently talking about men in church. Men, I'm talking to you now. And it says, you know, men in church, men are not very expressive and emotional, so you shouldn't expect that of men in church. Men are not very expressive and emotional. I've seen you watching your sports games, men, you know, screaming at the television, you know, the armchair quarterbacking that goes on. Men can be very expressive and emotional, even with superior sports like the World Cup. I've seen it happen. Uh, but, But that tends not to happen in the church. It's an interesting question, but do we allow ourselves to become excited about the things of God, or do we reserve that for trivia, like sports? I've just offended some of you by calling your sports trivial. Um, What's your view of death? Are we afraid because it feels unknown, or confident because we know that we will walk into the arms of Jesus? The more Jesus is our center, the less threatening these questions are. Our faith cannot be in Jesus and Paul the Apostle was able to say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The danger is that we are locked into the past, either locked into the past of our own religious experience or even locked into the past of this church and we fail to see what God is up to now. I'm so thankful for Don Hinkle's message at the 75th anniversary service. His message was essentially this, the best is yet to come. If I could have paid him to preach that message, I would have paid him, but he just did it because God told him to and I'm very thankful for that. That there is a rich and beautiful history here at Central, but we can't look back and think those were the glory days. Do you remember when God was really at work in Central? I agree with Don that the best is yet to come, and I don't say that in any self-aggrandizing way, meaning, oh, it's because I'm here that the best is yet to come. (laughs) Actually, that's pretty much irrelevant. The best is yet to come because God is not finished with us yet. There are lives he wants to change, habits he wants to break, marriages he wants to heal, lost neighbors that he wants to save, and a city that he wants to transform. And if Jesus is our all in all, if Jesus is our everything, he will do that. If we are sold out to him and what he wants to do with our lives, with this church, with this city, then amazing things can happen. So our response this morning is to embrace Jesus as our all in all, not Jesus and something else. We put our weight and our trust on him and nowhere else. 
So there's the challenge. There may be some things we need to let go of and say, God, you you moved in that way in my life in the past, but I can't cling on to that. I want to know what you have for me now. I think that's uh, that's what we saw with the Israelites, isn't it? They, They started longing for the things of Egypt, even though that was slavery and captivity. And God was providing them with fresh manna daily. And I think that's the mentality we have to have. God, what do you have for me today in terms of my experiencing of you? Not looking back to, you know, what did you have for me 10 years ago or 20 years ago or when I became a Christian? I I find it a little bit sad. You know, when we ask people to give their testimony, um, what we normally hear is the point at which they became a Christian. And I want to know, what has God done for you lately? I want to know what is God up to in your life right now? What is he working on? What is he challenging you with? What is he showing you? How is he blessing you? How is he challenging you? That's what I want to know because this is the now of God. Not just the past, not the past testimony, but what is God revealing to us now as individuals and as a church? And we look for where God is working and join him. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. There's some things we need to let go of. And there's some things we need to hold on to unto death, if necessary. And that is Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this example, this first martyr, who, even though he knew it would end up in him dying, was unafraid to speak the truth about you. And Lord, you know our hearts. You know that we do sometimes hold on to things. And we do hold things as of higher value than you and we don't mean to but it just sort of slips in and we start cherishing experiences or habits or traditions uh, and they're not the center they're not you so lord i pray that you'll help us have a right perspective on you that we can certainly appreciate history and traditions and even preferences to a degree but we will never let them eclipse you jesus you are our all in all you are our everything amen We'd like to invite any of you who would like